We are really lucky to have Brian Barker back again. So if you haven't seen the prior one where Brian went over the mRNA vaccines, you should go check that out. Today, we want to talk about some other vaccines, DNA vaccines, new variants, what the implications of that is for the vaccinations. Why do you feel bad after you get a vaccine? And is it a good thing or a bad thing? So thank you for coming on the show again, Brian. Of course. Happy to help out. So the first question we had is um, there are DNA vaccines coming now. So in the past, we said, you know, you nanoparticle, mRNA goes into the cell. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Nothing's getting screwed up with my DNA, so I'm good. But uh, there's at least a few of these that are coming that are actually going to insert DNA into you. And then you are going to make mRNA yourself. So do I have that right? You do have that right. Um, but you want to think really uh closely about a couple pieces of that inserting DNA. So first of all, and this is true with the mRNA vaccine as well, um, you're not inserting that nucleic acid into every cell of your body. Um, You're inserting it into a few cells that are at the injection site or immune cells at the injection site that may phagocytose um, this. And so the first thing to think about is that anything that was getting modified would be a relatively small number of cells not a large number. But then we have to think about the DNA piece. Um, The DNA that's used in a DNA vaccine is a circle of DNA called a plasmid. Um, Your chromosomes are linear DNA. And the plasmid that we put in for a DNA vaccine um, remains separate from your chromosomes. It stays a little extra circle of DNA in the cell. It doesn't actually integrate into um, the chromosomal DNA. Um, the technical term here is that it remains episomal. So it remains a little circle of DNA. Um, that DNA actually is not going to get copied when your a cell divides, is not going to move to another cell, um, and it's going to be there um, producing mRNA uh, for a relatively short period of time, the cell will eventually actually lose that um, DNA. So I haven't thought about this as much um, clinically, but actually in my research, I put small circles of plasma DNA into cells all the time um, in something called, a, I call a transient transfection um, because I ex- only expect that DNA to be there for a few days. Um, and for me, it's actually sometimes really hard to make sure that the cells don't kick the DNA out. Um, if I wanted to integrate that DNA into the chromosome, I would have to do a lot of additional steps um, and work hard to get a rare event of integration. Um, none of those things are happening in the case of a DNA vaccine. You have no idea how better that makes me feel. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, oh, we've done a really good job, I think, of explaining to most people the safety of mRNA vaccines. But it was like, if this gets inserted into every one of my chromosomes and every cell of my body, I can't say that this is safe. No, so so this, you've got your chromosomes over here, and this is a little plasma thing that's separate from those. But exactly. is it in the nucleus? And uh, it just it stays there the, for a while? It is in the nucleus um, because that's where the enzymes to make mRNA live. And so that you need the DNA to be in that location. Some people may ask a question who thought a little bit about this, about... Um, a process called um, recombination. Is there some way that that DNA plasmid could get inserted and integrated through this um, process of recombination? Um, The probabilities of that happening are exceedingly rare. Part of it would require the plasmid to match some part of your genome, and we make sure that doesn't happen. Um, If it happened, it would be I don't know, a one in a billion situation that it might happen in one of your cells and the immune system would clean that up um, pretty quickly. But to be honest with you, I'm not sure I can always even get it to happen one in a billion times in my research. So is, uh, you, are you using a virus vector to get this in there or can you do the same sort of lipid uh, nano I, layer I, and throw it in that way? We use the same kind of lipid um, just with a circular piece of DNA. So it'd be very similar to the Moderna and Pfizer, it, uh, exactly, just with DNA. It's exactly the same. In fact, when I was first learning about the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, and when I think about the proprietary nanoparticle, at least in my head, I assume it's the thing I use in the lab, uh, in my research lab, to put DNA into cells. Interesting. Now, it doesn't have to be because we know some of these are adenovirus vectors, monkey right. and, and so non-monkey. And so an adenovirus vector is a little bit different than a straight DNA vaccine. Mm-hmm. And is it... Um, is it different substantially from it 
the DNA doesn't act differently. It's just the way it gets in there. Uh, it's mostly different in terms of uh, how the DNA gets in there. Um, so an adenovirus, um, which is one of the viruses that causes the common cold, um, is a DNA virus. It has a DNA genome, and that DNA stays episomal, stays as a little circular piece of DNA in a cell when you get a cold, too. It's hmm. exactly the same thing. The idea with the adenovirus is that we modified it to put in, to make it deliver the spike um, encoding region as well. Um, so uh, any DNA virus is working this way in your cell as it is. Okay. Oh, this is so good. All right. Now let's change track now. Whoop. Um, single dose uh, efficacy of mRNA vaccines is really um, hot right now. The reason is because uh, we could double the number of people we could give this to if we said, look, we'll just give you one dose or we'll give you one dose now and we'll give you a second dose six months from now when production is up. So what do we know about single dose efficacy right now? So there are two different ways you could kind of think about single dose efficacy. One is by actually looking at um, efficacy data. That's a weird way of phrasing this, uh, to look at how many people got infected in some of the trials. Um, the other thing that I've been considering when I've looked at these data are some of the data on antibody responses, um, which were published from the phase one and phase two, and at least in one case, I've seen it from the phase three. Um, the trials themselves are about 30,000 people. Um, there are uh, data from about 1,000 people um, who got a single shot and didn't get a second shot. And so we know um, some data from a much smaller number of people. Um, it seems um, potentially efficacious, although the confidence interval is huge. Um, mm. I think when I looked at it yesterday, the confidence interval was something like 20 to 80 percent efficacious. Mm. Um, if you look at the data on antibodies, there is a dramatic increase in antibody levels with the boost. Um, and so every time I look at that, the, the antibody data, I say, oh, my gosh, the boost is doing an amazing job at inducing antibodies. We don't know what the bar is for how many antibodies protect you. Um, and so it's possible that that lower level is enough. Um, the small number of people who have it's been trialed in suggests that perhaps it is. Um, personally, I would want to see um, data in a larger subset of people um, before I made conclusions about uh, going to a single dose. Right. And uh, so this is perhaps why uh, one of the Moderna scientists just came out and said, we think the Moderna virus produces such high levels of antibodies that it's going to last for a few years. Um, but we don't have this data on single dose. And now the other question is, what about half dose? So in the original phase one, phase two trials, they did I think 50 nanograms and then 50 nanograms versus 100 and 100. And they found in the 18 to 55 year old age group that they both developed a similar antibody response. But um, are you saying uh, that, I guess my question is, how well does those lab results correlate with uh, it, the clinical exactly. efficacy? I, I have not seen clinical efficacy data on the lower dose, on the 50 uh, dose. We've only seen clinical efficacy on the, the 100 dose. Um, and so I would want to see that um, beforehand. It seems like the antibody level being a little lower is okay. I would prefer to stick with what we've done in the trials because we have data and have um, approved things. Um, I do know that the Pfizer DNA dose is a little bit lower than the Moderna dose. Um, and I think they, Moderna has some internal data, I've been told. Um, about those uh, that lower dose working, but I haven't yet seen that data. And I, as so I understand it, they are actually doing some trials, further trials on that now. Exactly. So we might get some data, but it's going to be about two months. Um, so we don't know for sure. And that's why uh, people have been confused um, why the FDA was uh, even considering this, because we had some of this data that we've talked about. Lots of people getting vaccines now. Whether you get a DNA virus um, vaccine, whether you get an mRNA encoded one, is there any way that these can produce false positive PCRs? No. And uh, there are kind of two reasons for that. One, if we think about a DNA vaccine or an mRNA vaccine, it's going into the muscle and you're putting that DNA or RNA into those few cells at the site and few immune cells. When you take your sample for PCR, you're usually taking something like a nasal swab. 
And so the DNA is not going to move between those two sites um, to make your PCR positive. The other reason is that um, different PCR assays are testing for um, multiple genes in the virus. Um, so some of them test for spike, but I know, for example, I believe it's called the TAC path um, tests for three different uh, genes, two of which are not spike. And spike's the only part of this virus that's in the vaccine. So there's no possible way that those could be positive because they're not in the vaccine. And even the spike is not going to somehow have the uh, nucleic acid go from your arm to your nose. The antibodies will move through the blood, but the nucleic acid will not. Great. And actually, this brings up a question which I didn't uh, write down beforehand, which is um, my understanding is that this is how you can tell that there are uh, different serotypes of the or variants of the virus, because sometimes the gene, uh, the PCR is testing for a set of genes and one of them is slightly changed and it doesn't show up on your, your assay. Uh, is that correct? Um, yes, although it's slightly more complicated than that. So sure I mentioned that I mentioned the TAC path um, assay. Um, so it's looking for three genes. One of them is spike, um, and that sometimes drops out. It is no longer positive um, because there's been some kind of change in the virus. In the UK, um, they have then gone back and sequenced the uh, versions of the virus that have that. Um, PCR uh, difference and have shown that right now, 99% of the uh, viruses that are coming up with that PCR assay are also this viral variant. If you look back at their data from earlier in the uh, pandemic, um, samples that had that same um, te test uh, results did not have this, uh, this particular genetics. Um, and so Overall, being having that PCR dropout does not mean that it is definitely the British variant. But right now, we've seen in the UK that the sequencing does seem to show that if the PCR dropout is there, it's because there is this variant. Is there any um, concern on the part of the expert virologists like yourself and your friends on TWIV um, that these variants, the South African variant, the British variant, are significant enough so that the vaccine might not work or at so, least be reduced in efficacy? Sure. There actually was a uh, preprint that was published about this that talked a little bit about this earlier this week. Um, so the spike protein has about 20 places in it um, where you are making antibodies or immune responses. So 20 epitopes. Um, in the British variant, it seems like none of the changes in spike affect any of those epitopes. In the South African variant, one of the changes slightly diminishes one of the epitopes, but the other 19 are not affected. And so we don't think that either of these should impact whether the vaccine actually works. Now everybody is, you know, hopefully will get vaccinated soon. Um, do we have to time this uh, in any special way with flu, without flu shots, without all of the other vaccines that people are getting constantly? I know that the CDC is recommending that you have a two-week interval in between vaccine doses. Um, I know that that's not what we do with some other vaccines, and so that may change over time, but right now the CDC recommendation is a two-week interval. All right, so you're lucky enough to get the vaccine, and the next day you've got a sore arm, but you've also got aches and pains and a low-grade fever. You've got like a viral syndrome. I always understood that meant that you are having a good immune response, and that's a good thing. Not a bad thing. That is exactly true. Many of those signs you're talking about, the, the you know, feeling poorly, you know, maybe having a little bit of a fever, things like that, are all the result of a group of proteins your immune system makes called cytokines. You might have heard of interferon. Um, everything you're, you're talking about there is basically interferon's fault. Um, and so you made a lot of interferon, um, and that's great for your immune response. Exciting. Um, I'm also excited about the data. I was, went back to look at the New England Journal data from Moderna and stuff. And I was like, okay, so I've had one vaccine. When do the the uh, COVID curves start to come apart? And it, even by 12 days, it looks like those curves are already coming apart. You're getting protection even after 12 days. So that uh, makes me happy. Yeah, that data is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so beautiful. And then once you have your second dose, seven days after your second dose, four weeks later, the curves are just enormously different. It's really pretty impressive. 
Uh, is there any other data, anything else that uh, you've been talking about on TWIV or that you've been reading that you think the ER docs might want to know about? The biggest thing that we've talked about recently on TWIV is um, that A, um, this new variant um, doesn't seem to have differences in whether it's uh, virulent or changing uh, vaccine responses, as we talked about. Um, the, the only changes we see are changes potentially in transmissibility, and people are, are debating that a little bit. And that just tells us how much more important all of our non-pharmaceutical interventions are, like our masks. So we have a lot less room for error right now um, if that is more transmissible. And so we want to be really uh, you know, on top of that. Um, I also think that we need to get a little more data on spacing of the two vaccine doses, um, because that's a little bit of a trickier question. Yeah. So it would be nice if we could wait three months and have good efficacy and you know, that would uh, feed into that public health sort of discussion, but we don't have that data yet. We, we don't have that data. We, you know, I'm, I would assume, um, I don't officially know this, but it is my uh, hunch that the reason why those boosts are at three weeks for Pfizer and four weeks for Moderna is because they wanted to get you protected ASAP. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we could wait longer, but I'd love to see the data before um, really knowing about that. I would guess there's probably a sweet spot and we don't want to miss it. Mm -hmm. There was, uh, you had an interesting discussion with your colleagues on TWIV about why a virus might become more infectious. Um, it could be things like you're just excreting more um, from your upper airway. It could be because you're asymptomatic a little bit longer. Um, so there was a number of different theories there. Um, and it's got to be very difficult when you're going through a uh, incredibly rapid rise in the virus to work out, is it something intrinsic about the virus or is it just that it was going to take off anyway? So we don't exactly know how much more infectious this might be, but it doesn't actually change things from a public health point of view. Right, exactly. And so I think that you know, that's been an important message for me to tell to all of my uh, friends and family members who are not scientists, is that, um, you know, this should not mean that they are should be afraid of the virus getting through their mask or something like that. Um, it's largely the same types of interventions um, that are necessary. Um, you know, should we say this virus is more transmissible, um, depending on where you come down on that? Um, all it means is that we want to be a little stricter. And so we should be doing the best with the same measures we've been doing. So it's the, the distancing, the masks, the not being in, uh, indoors as much as possible with other people. Exactly. Um, all stays the same. Whether it's 50% more infectious or it's the same infectiousness, it all stays the same. Thank you so much for your time. Um, like I said at the beginning, you are the, now a rock star. You're an official member of emergency medicine as far as my colleagues are concerned. They really are relying cool. on you and Toiv. It's been fantastic. Well, thank you. I, I have... Uh, really been learning a lot from you all as well. Um, it's really nice to kind of get some better and more informed information about the clinical side of this. So I am learning a lot from you guys.